Alan the lifeboat had called Lowestoft home for long enough, and we need to keep relentlessly eating up those northern bound miles if we're to succeed. The radio now works flawlessly, and I celebrated by booking us in the evening before for a bridge lift. Lowestoft Harbour, this is Alan. Um, I'm requesting um, permission to go through the... As I was pre-warned, radio traffic is quite casual in this fishing port, so I tried to fit in. Lowestoft Harbour, this is Alan. That sounds perfect. We will update you when we're on the move in the morning. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll put you on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Out. Dreams of strict radio voice protocols in tatters, the evening drew in and my companion for the leg arrived in time for a plan, a pint and a sleep. So I've just left Tyron to go and get himself ready for the morning and I'm just going to go and set up the boat for overnight and then we'll set off early in the morning. Some in the comments have asked and here's the answer. At the moment I've been sleeping on a luxury air mattress in the stern zone. But soon it was a bruising five o'clock in the morning. By now you'll know about my love for early starts. This is a five o'clock start, although as you can see it's already nice and light. But bed hair in place, I'm now ready to go on the water. At least we had a bright summer sunrise. Alan rightly prefers a crew totalling two at a minimum, and so I found a companion, designed and built in South Africa. Yeah. Everyone on the channel, welcome to Tyrant. We are about to do leg two together. It's been a friendly first stepping stone marina, and it definitely pays off to plan and communicate ahead, rather than haphazardly alerting a harbour about Alan's need for accommodation as and when we turn up. This is our last morning at Lowestoft Haven Marina, and we're about to head up on the first of these two mini legs up to Wells Next the Sea, and then up to Grimsby, up to the Humber Cruising Association Marina, which apparently is really smart. And I know someone there, so that's really nice. Um, let me just uh, get myself through this gate. Obviously the security here is tight as it needs to be to look after Alan. Um, so this time round, I'm going to be traveling with Tyron, as, as you've just seen, and uh, actually super experienced. He's done plenty of time on the med, but actually spent uh, years now working on the Thames, uh, running quite big passenger boats up and down and maneuvering in all sorts of different difficult spots. So I think we're gonna have a really good time. And I think he might be pleasantly surprised at how well Alan maneuvers, or at least I hope so. Other than expressing warm sentiments for Lowestoft, we did need to uncover and top Allenson up with air and prepare the mooring lines. I've been pleased with my new polyprope mooring lines, which are much lighter and easier to store than the old nylon ones, but I should have got the string ropes in a different colour so I can tell them apart from the shorter bow and stern lines. Right, we've done an engine start-up test and now what I'll do is simply start us up again so that we can just let the engine warm up before we head off. I volunteered Tyron to helm for the start so he could familiarise and get a feel for Alan's lack of handling before heading into open water. I advertise Alan, of course, as an unusual boat to any newcomers. All right, I'll just give us a quick uh, push off from the bow if that's right. All right, yeah. That's cool. I'm trying to split the journey at this stage into roughly 100 mile legs over pairs of days, giving me flexibility with travel and getting solid mileages in. This time, lower staff to Grimsby, stopping off at Wells Next the Sea. It would be cheaper to anchor halfway near Blakeney Point, but the anchor chain through hole only just arrived and I don't want the anchor out of the hatch palaver we dealt with on our misjudged leg one brief stop near the Harwich shipping lane. Having offered Tyron and Alan a careful introduction, with all the normal precautions, in a neutral non-territorial location, without overstimulating and avoiding unnecessarily direct eye contact, he had the grand tour of both first and standard class accommodation. Alan and Tyron became fast friends. We needed a bridge lift again of course, and the options were a crack sparrow 0630 or late morning. Late morning was obviously out, as we had 55 miles to devour, so early it was. Lowest off to harbour, this is Alan. Uh, we are proceeding um, over to the bridge. We should be on time for the 0630 bridge opening. If that's still okay, your end, over. Lowest off to harbour, understood, out. The speed limit is four knots in the harbour and river. Believe it or not, Alan can easily exceed that, and so we kept the noise, speed and revs leashed for now, as we passed the docks and the moored mixture of ships and boats. A survey vessel was the only companion we had in our direction of travel. We're just waiting for a large commercial ship to come through first, and so we'd be told to hold station just to the west of this new bridge that they're building, and so we're just doing little circuits. It's actually quite nice for Tyron to get a feel for the manoeuvrability, so we know how tight we can circle and all that sort of thing. Uh, just enjoying a beautiful, beautiful morning. It could not be nicer. We all waited for the ship to spin around a few times. 
It took a good quarter of an hour, so I put myself to work in the best way I knew how. Let's take a chance for some breakfast. Croissant and blueberry jam. Lots of both. It's not quite a Danish pastry, but it'll do. And then we received the green light to motor mightily and at pace towards freedom once more. Initially, we built up with ease to about a four or five knot pace, but we were still in the sheltered waters near the harbour entrance and hadn't begun to interact with the current to any real extent. In any case, I took the chance for some time on deck. Uh, behind you can see, well, you know, off the bow, you can see there's another wind farm. There are millions of wind farms here. Hopefully you'll notice and appreciate that for the longer distance clips of offshore footage, I've brought along an extra camera famed for its stabilisation features so we should have left all that juddering from leg one behind us as a bad memory. None of these legs, or day-long sub-legs, let's call them thighs, can be achieved in a single tide, so it's inevitable for at least one part of each that will have some flow against us, or at least not with us. It turned out that our hard work needed to be put in straight away. A couple of knots of adverse tide and a little swell meant that we only managed only modest progress through most of the morning. Upping the engine revs would achieve little except burn fuel, as we found long ago that the prop gives good thrust in the middle sweet spot of the book's rev range. But enough messing around in the sun and counting off the channel markers, I have checks to make. Will I come back and inspect the exhaust and also Allenson? Both the hot air and poor Allenson following in that hot air were indeed still where we left them, and onto the engine. The new air intake duct isn't drawing in engine bay air, this is good, but it means that the air in there is not being replaced now, and it's getting hot. Leaving a panel off for now helps, but it's also so I can keep an eye on the front seal, which has been very slowly spraying out oil into a ring shape in the bilge. The quantity of oil is tiny, but I have a replacement seal now, for the next time it's feasible to have a mechanic swap it and the gasket out. For fellow Book DV48 owners, here's the official Book part specification, so you can source it without the comedy price markup I had to pay. I even checked on how well the new cup holders were doing. This should concern you, it certainly concerned me. So I jumped up into the driver's seat and took my turn as the slow pace against the tide ground on. Having to fight the tide a bit, it's coming right on our bow and so we're only managing about two and a half, three knots right now, but we're just coming past Yarmouth with its famous, famous Ferris reel and I think um, there's a big pier there as well. Great Yarmouth was the highlight of the first day, which tells you something about how featureless the Suffolk and Eastern Norfolk coastline is. But looking at the online tide predictions, we knew the lazy walking pace doldrums were soon to become more, let's say, a moderate jogging speed. Up to nearly five knots. Yeah, point seven. The tide is finally working with us a bit. Well, I need to get in In fact, four became five, then six, and over seven knots for a time. We were clawing back the lost time, and the adrenaline coursing through with the morning's constant peril got the better of Tyron, and he recharged. This gave me the chance to decide I needed to upgrade the driving position. I'm thinking a sort of bucket seat insert to support us a bit better, and some higher up foot supports. The new harness is soon to be installed as well. There was something of a swell, and since we were hugging the coastline to within a few miles of the shore, the water was only a few metres deep. Rather like in the Thames estuary, the shallows, plus a modest wind, ended up delivering a bumpy ride and being overtaken by waves from behind. I noticed this settled down really noticeably once the water depth is more than five metres or so. But it didn't stop me enjoying all the voyage peppering the coastline, because, let's face it, the landscape to the left was still as captivating as before. I cannot wait for Scotland and Norway. Cromer has a church, so that's nice for the residents of Cromer. But Alan has a solar panel, which by the way is keeping the battery bank topped up, quietly and without a fuss. And he also has neatly stowed fenders. I was scraping the barrel for entertainment, and this is coming from a man who has skied in a straight line for over a hundred days straight. The wind, plus a couple of knots of friendly tides, sped us towards the end of day one, a little place I chose to stop called Wells Next the Sea. The suffix there is important for clarity, otherwise residents and visitors frequently forget and mistakenly think that they are landlocked. A couple of boats were hanging around the channel entrance, which is narrow and shallow, and so it was no surprise that my call to the harbour went unanswered. It was too early in the tide for them to man the radio yet. We'd have to hold station roughly, if the wind and tide would let us. So Tyron has uh, expertly guided us over to the uh, Cardinal Boy. So, should we now work out where the... Oh, it's 
either the wind or the currents that's strongest and then we can hold station for a short while. In the end I decided to motor slowly back and forth to kill the three quarters of an hour before the water rose high enough. This really is a good incentive for me to get that new anchor chain conduit done because we now have to hang around for about an hour or so outside the harbour channel whilst it fills full of water and for the guys to start um, answering the radio in the harbour and uh, rather like some other boats here we're just waiting and if we were able to deploy the anchor in a split second that would be an obvious thing to do but we're not so we're just going to poodle around at one or two knots and enjoy ourselves and try and keep ourselves pointing into the wind so we don't get rocked around so yes i am going to finish that conduit pipe as soon as i can well this is what the pottering back and forth looked like the little bit of chop running over the sandbanks actually would have made temporary anchorage very uncomfortable, so motoring kept us facing into and then away from the wind. On the hour, the radio pinged into activity with everyone, nearly a dozen boats now, requesting permission to enter. It's time, we'll start heading in. Some of the boats had much deeper keels, so we were amongst the first to form a queue, head to the channel marker, more on that later, and into the very impressively well-marked channel. The sandbars move around so much month to month that the harbour team have to constantly adjust the voyage. Right, so we're just heading to the channel. Tyron's at the controls. Since I'm familiar with Alan's various lines and fenders, and I'm used to nipping up onto the deck, we swap seats once again, so to speak. The harbour website has a brilliant aerial drone sequence to demonstrate how to navigate the channel, so instead of copying them, I've gone for an Alan's eye view of the approach to wells next to the sea. Past all the little beach huts, which are very smart, and we could tell that those on the paths and on the beach were taking rather more notice than usual in the day's boating traffic. In fact, one of the lifeboat volunteers at the station had messaged me on Instagram to say that they had spotted us offshore and took a photo as we passed. Thanks for that, and for the warm welcome. Twists and turns followed in quick succession. You'd never manage this without channel markers, not in a month of Sundays. And, calmly and patiently, Tyron used the flood tide to gently bring us alongside, where two kind harbour managers stood to help with lines and to collect the very reasonable overnight fee, which includes all facilities. Yeah. How shallow as it comes. Yeah, we had to uh, do a bit of a 180 over there. Right, after a very, very long day of hard work, Alan could finally shut down. Wells really is the quintessential little port town, friendly and with practically nothing open or serving food latish in the evening. Never mind, we enjoyed the evening light, made some ham and cheese rolls, and transferred 80 or so litres of fuel from the bladder and into the main tank. I've yet to perfect this system, but it did work. I learned not to run the supply tank too low, as the fuel being returned from the engine was pretty hot the day before, and wasn't being given a chance to cool down before being sucked back in the engine for another try at being burned. Morning followed night, as is typical even in Norfolk, and it was time to reawaken Alan and put day two's slightly longer and more complicated plan into action, but not before an excellent hot shower, which started me off in a buoyant mood. Very different from expedition life. Warm, showers, clean, all happy, ready to go. We couldn't make another extra early start as the high tide wasn't in about 10 o'clock, and according to the locals, there wouldn't be enough water until 8 o'clock, Somewhat cheekily, we made a go of it at 7.40. We had asked for an easy spot on the pontoon, having not visited before, but to be honest, all the spaces were easy to moor to. Tide is pouring in, which is exactly what we need. We need a little bit more water than we can head off. Ours was near the northern end of the pontoon, on the outside, as were most medium-sized boats, and this made pushing off exceptionally relaxed. Let's get going, day two of leg two. Tyron did the lines this time, and we knew that we should take advantage of our early start, as it was for certain that a small flotilla of fishermen and tour boats would soon follow at eight, and they'd be faster than us, which in the narrow channel could lead to compromising Alan's hitherto sterling local reputation by causing a traffic jam. This is very, very shallow. We probably only have about 10 centimeters below Alan's hull, but uh, you know what? We're making it for now. Alan has no sounder, so I looked around for visual signs that may give away extra shallow areas or obstructions. 
The wheel vibrated and jiggled around a bit, as I suspect the turbulence caused by the prop was only a few inches above the channel bed, and so was being reflected straight back up at the prop guard. Feeding for any little bumps, because uh, we don't want really to touch bottom, even though the keel's quite re resilient. It'd be nice not to scrape Alan, if you wouldn't appreciate it. Soon we were caught, but aside from one impatient chap who forced us right to the side of the channel, the rest cruised past in the broader sections and showed the sort of respect for the speed limits you'd expect in such a lawless, devil-may-care corner of rural England. Yeah. I was going to make sure we don't get reflected waves here knocking us back into the wrong direction. It's amazing how the deepest water can be closest to what appears to be dry land or marsh, such are the peculiar and powerful whims of flowing water. The channel opened up into the calm, perfect blue North Sea, and that cardinal marker once again. Well, I googled it, and it's new, well, new in 2013, and the makers are very, very proud of it, with its own news page. Cloud in medium density UV stabilised polyethylene, no less. Well done, Hydrosphere. Wells is proud of you. Don't say I never bring you the key imperative issues of our time. Oh, it's nice up here. Anyhow, we motored on with the fuel so kindly donated by many of you in Alan's online army, where, by the way, contributions to help with marina and upcoming technician costs are still enormously appreciated. This is the deepest water Alan has consistently been in whilst under my command, bluer, flatter and altogether more agreeable. I could get used to this, on a calm sunny day at least. The day's route would see us headed mostly in a straight line northish from Wells and avoiding the strong tides heading into and out of the wash, a basin to the west. We'd have to avoid crashing into any wind turbines, or straying into the MOD firing range, or being chased and mauled by any of the seals that live there in a constant state of bemusement. This did leave a little more time for being on deck when not hard at work inside, not least to re-inspect the mast, and in particular the connections to the AAS side, with its antenna and GPS receiver. I was still racking my brains as to why I couldn't get the unit out of silent mode. But I was soon distracted by Alan's newest accoutrement, on leg one, we both yearned after one, so I bought Alan a little wind indicator, temporarily strapped here to test. It's even orange. Excellent. There's Darren, who's doing a great job on his shift at the helm, and we're now coming towards the entrance to the Humber. Now, the Humber is a very, very, very busy shipping channel coming into Hull and Immingham. Um, luckily, Grimsby, where we're going to, is the first bit you get to round on the sort of southern shore of the uh, of the entrance. But that does mean that we need to deal with the VTS, who are the guys who organise traffic coming in and out, ask permission to go here, there and everywhere, and then hopefully we can then transfer over to the particular harbour uh, control a little bit after that, and then they can let us through the lock into where the marina is going to be, where the cruising association, our hosts for the night, are going to be. Uh, so yeah, we need to kind of switch on, we, just, we need to start reporting our whereabouts and as we go past certain boys, we have to tell the VTS that we are there, otherwise they have no idea who we are and they'll pick us up on radar and they'll think that we're coming to invade, which is not too much of a stretch for Alan, but I think even he might make heavy weather of invading Grimsby. We called off the invasion for the time being, and before I needed to get busy on the radio, I tried the next stage of my AIS diagnostics palaver. Lots of unhappy red crosses on the software. Perhaps the antenna was faulty somewhere. So I took it out of the loop to see if we could get a connection. I used this very clever rollable emergency VHF antenna, which is designed to be used by either a VHF radio or an AIS. So, an ideal stand-in. By the way, it's made by Revolve, the guys who also make the rollable boat hooks. But, alas, no luck. Although I was able to pick up some GPS satellites for the first time. So just the final piece left in the jigsaw. I will win in the end, and let you lot track Alan's position. So long as you promise not to bother him. He passionately dislikes autograph hunters, as he can't hold a pen. Because Alan is a boat. Humber VTS, Alan. Uh, we're just proceeding past the outer Ross Reach Boy and are heading to Grimsby Fish Docks. Being a very large port, the radio traffic was distinctly more formal than down south, and we knew that we'd had to take into account a strong four-knot current as the water escaped from the River Humber. With sand flats, wrecks and restricted areas, we must not get dragged anywhere perilous by the water or wind. I was now on listening watch constantly, and it was fascinating to hear all the commercial traffic conversations, confusions and outright arguments. Grimsby appeared all of a sudden, and as I'd been warned, especially as we travelled directly into the bright sun, the entrance to the smaller fish dock lock was partly hidden until the last moment. 
Tyron, Alan, Allenson and I had made excellent time, an hour faster even than our optimistic estimate, so too early to pass through the lock at high water free flow. Welcome to Grimsby. Now the final entrance through the lock to be penned as opposed to going through during free flow. Uh, Neil was quite hectic. Alan decided that he wanted to try and make friends with all the four different sides of the lock. Uh, Maneuverability in that sort of space without a uh, valve thruster is pretty hard. Anyway, we managed to get in, but I wasn't able to move fast enough to set up the camera to show you it. So there was only that little short clip of us uh, trying to keep him away from, I think, the, the left hand side of the lock. Anyway, regardless, no damage done, and we're now moored and berthed, and this is Alan's new temporary home. This is the cruising association, not a commercial marina, but in many senses it operates in a similar manner, and they kindly booked us in, despite the office being officially closed. Tyron had to rush off to catch the last train back to London, and I stayed on to clean and tidy up. What next then? In a similar manner to before, I need to bounce up and down between London, Allen, and work venues, which means longer and more exorbitantly priced train tickets. I'm also acutely aware that we have dropped behind best case scenario schedule and I'm having to start penciling in major work like having the flywheel and front cover off the engine. Necessary, but frustrating. As ever, we will push on to our inevitable, eventual victory. Yes, I hear you all roar. Bye.